Stanford University. Welcome to AA380. The quarter is zooming along. Uh, next week I will not be here, but Dennis will be. So, um, one side, one sort of side note. While trade secrets are never discussed in AA380, many of the things discussed are subject to various forms of intellectual property protection. And last week's talk on Wave Glider was no exception. So, the speaker wanted to make that clear that. Can't really, you shouldn't go out and start a company based on those cool little devices. Um, AA380 is an engineering class. As such, we're not, we're not just concerned with knowledge, but how that knowledge makes a difference. However, much of that time, the difference doesn't really come to us as technologists. It goes to everybody as a whole, and yeah, we get some too, but we don't get anything special out of the deal. Today's talk is different. It's about surprising methods that help us with one of the hardest problems, programming parallel systems. Today's speaker is Anwar Galoom from Intel. Thank you. So uh, I thought I'd start by talking a little bit about the history of what will come in the talk. Uh, I originally was in Intel Labs, which uh, used to be called the Corporate Technology Group. It's the research arm of Intel. And I'm sure a few of you have had interactions with them. Uh, we were working on um, sort of pathfinding, or what we call pathfinding, for, for new architectures and, and new programming tools for those architectures. One of those architectures was, uh, uh, and is today, Larrabee, uh, yeah, which is a forthcoming product. The the uh, in the course of that work, we started looking at making parallel programming easier for that kind of device, a device that had you know, more than eight cores, a device that had, you know, really wide, um, real, you know, really wide vector units with really rich vector instruction sets. Um, and, you know, we started looking at this sort of space of data parallelism, and, in, and for some of us it was kind of a blast from the past, you know, stuff we'd worked on, you know, in the late 80s and early 90s, you know, was sort of relevant again. And, uh, you know, we started working on this data parallel API called CT. I'll tell you more about that later. Um, and at some point, we kind of, you know, made a decision. And, you know, you often do this, but usually you sort of do it without knowing it, um, about what, what, what road you're going to go down with this technology and research. The one thing you should know about Intel Labs is that, you know, the, the kind of work they do is a lot closer to product development than, you know, say, you might find in other industrial labs. You know, it might be something that's pathfinding for a next generation product, right? Something that they're going to start doing design work on within, within a year. Uh, so, one path you could take, and this is the one that we usually sort of default into, is to, you know, do this work, um, develop a credible, you know, enough research prototype and just sort of spit out, you know, little pieces of learnings and, and uh, understanding about, say, performance or architecture or uh, programming stacks that, that can be used by product groups, either internal product groups that are developing new chips, new processors, new, um, you know, Ex uh, versions of programming tools, or you know, partners, you know, ISVs that are uh, looking to enhance, you know, sort of the, you know, the, the capabilities of their software on our next generation processors. That's what we usually end up doing because the other path is is a little trickier. Um, we end up looking at um, uh, the other path as something that um, uh, requires more heavy lifting than a research organization can really assume. In particular, if you want to come out of this without just sort of these nuggets of, of wisdom, which are important, uh, and something that could transition more seamlessly to a product, you know, again, like, you know, a fuller artifact, like a, a, a code base, a corpus of software that can be turned more readily into a product, um, you end up having to do a lot of things that normally aren't uh, part of the sort of the research agenda, right? You end up having to go out and uh, kind of talk to customers, you know, understand more about their requirements, you know, look at, for example, you know, in the case of what we're talking about here, um, requirements for uh, performance debugging and, and, you know, debugging tools in general, right? Tools are kind of this, you know, <coughs> you know, stepchild we ignore, 
a lot of times when we're looking at new programming models. Uh, but if you're going to productize something, you, you just can't because no one will use this unless they're sort of, you know, there's reasonable integration with existing programming uh, environments and, you know, tools that'll, you know, make use of this thing uh, easier, both in terms of debugging and uh, performance uh, optimization. So we spent a lot of time sort of going out and, um, you know, talking to customers, understanding their requirements, understanding their problems. And to some extent, the first part of this talk will, um, will draw from that you know, sort of the, the learnings that, uh, that came out of those discussions and sort of the, the reality check, right, that, that, that came out of, um, of uh, you know, interaction with, um, with developers working on, you know, products whose release cycle was, you know, six months out rather than three years out. Um, the other side of it, of course, is, you know, doing all the things that um, good software development organizations do around uh, quality control and, uh, you know, engineering processes and so on. We were, we were fortunate to sort of already have some of that in place and, um, you know, uh, and that wasn't so much of a problem uh, at Intel. Uh, but really, it was really more sort of understanding the gap to turning this into a real product. Um, and so, this talk is about CT technology, but it's, you know, it's about a contribution that we think that it will make toward, uh, you know, productive uh, programming tools uh, in, um, par in parallel computing. Um, and in particular, um, you know, I'll talk about sort of a couple of different flavors of uh, productivity impact we're interested in. Um, I, and, you know, I don't just mean, uh, you know, well, oh, I can just write this piece of code easily and it runs. I, I mean something maybe a little bit deeper than that around sort of, you know, adapting um, the use of a tool to, you know, existing software architecture, um, you know, to a landscape where, you know, the language of choice is, uh, you know, if one exists is as yet undetermined and, you know, there may be many, many choices that people make. So, so I'll talk about some of these realities and I'll sort of dance between a couple of them and um, I'll make reference to CT throughout, but uh, I won't actually tell you what CT is until part two, <laughs> so bear with me. Um, so, some realities in software development and the problems they cause us when we're trying to get people to use parallelism everywhere. Um, one of the things, one of the assumptions you, you might have um, if you come from, you know, kind of a, you know, a traditional HPC background is that the only thing that really matters is uh, Fortran and, and C. And there's a large segment of, of sort of the traditional HPC market segments that, you know, are primarily using Fortran and C. Although, surprisingly, more and more people are using, you know, C++ and C Sharp and Java and, and so on. Um, so you'd sort of look at that and, and think, you know, well, you know, that's, let's just focus our efforts there. Um, but then, you know, when we started, you know, sort of talking to customers and what they were interested in, um, you know, we kind of got a, a hint of, you know, this sort of vast, you know, set of, of tools and languages and frameworks that people were using that were, um, you know, not C <coughs> and not Fortran, or certainly not, you know, ki the kind of C and Fortran code you'd look at if you were, say, looking at a, you know, sort of the traditional, you know, automatic parallelizing and vectorizing compiler. And so we sort of, you know, we started looking back at um, the history of, of, you know, language adoption, where I'll define loosely language adoption as, you know, any kind of language that has, you know, um, you know some measure of commercial success or adoption in terms of deployment by, you know, one or more um, software developer. Uh, and uh, it was actually quite surprising, because, you know, you, you tend to look at, um, there's sort of this conventional wisdom that says that, you know, boy, getting a new programming language um, established takes, uh, uh, you know, like 10 years or 15 years or something like that. And then if you look at sort of the cadence of, of uh, the standards updates for some of these languages like C, C++, and, and Fortran, you know, it's, it's pretty, pretty spread apart. But if you look at, you know, sort of the history of, um, you know, sort of languages that have been introduced the last 19 years, um, there have actually been quite a few. Uh, and, you know, of, you know, fairly different flavors that are, that are being either, you know, they're in wide use today or on the verge of wide use. OpenCL is an example of that. Uh, and, you know, if you sort of take a, you know, a generous view, you, you end up seeing sort of a new language, you know, making its way out into the ecosystem um, with some measure of success every 12 months or so. Uh, if you sort of make this a little more conservative, take things off there that are, 
uh, you know, like R, which is essentially a, a re-implementation with some additional features of S, which is older. Um, you know, it maybe looks like one language every 18 months. Um, and so what this said to us was that, uh, you know, initially that, you know, geez, this, you know, trend toward consolidation of a single language wasn't real. Uh, and, uh, and beyond that, that people, um, if we looked at how people were developing applications today, they were far more comfortable developing in multi-language environments, right? Using language X here, language Y there, language Z in, the, in another place and sort of, you know, composing them. Even working around, you know, some horrendous barriers in the, you know, interoperability of these languages um, to do that just because there was such a productivity benefit to, you know, you know, using a scripting language for coordination and, you know, some legacy Fortran code that they had that was very well tuned and optimized and then, you know, some, uh, um, you know, C-sharp code for, uh, you know, interface. So, uh, and, you know, if you look at sort of this trend, you know, there's kind of this steady, you know, rate here and then a little spike here and you observe that, you know, sort of there's this burst of scripting languages, early web development that's led now to, uh, and I've left that off this list because they're not really languages, but you know, a, a slew of frameworks for, for web applications um, that have sort of you know, trailed this, this little spike in um, uh, scripting languages that are relevant in the, in the web app space. Um, and you know, we're, we're hypothesizing that you're going to see sort of a similar spike around parallel computing related tools. Now, they may not be sort of new languages. Um, modern languages actually give you uh, facilities, and I'll talk about this later, to introduce a lot of language-like features uh, without, um, uh, without introducing completely new syntax. But, you know, there's, you know, potentially this, this new uh, spike that's, uh, that's looming. And we see this in, you know, the use of um, domain-specific languages for, you know, color processing and, uh, um, you know, image processing and, and, a, and a variety of, of different, different things. So, so why, why would this happen? Why would we care about domain-specific languages? Um, one of the, you know, as I said earlier, you know, as I'll talk about again and again, you know, productivity is a major factor in the software development cycle. Uh, you know, you're, you're more likely than not to throw out a purely performance-related feature or a feature that's enabled by performance that's, you know, sort of um, of marginal benefit from a differentiation point of view if it means you delay your release by a month or two months or six months. Uh, so productivity often trumps everything in terms of, uh, you know, managing software development. And, uh, and the only way to sort of, you know, traditionally, you know, when you think of, uh, you know, sort of lower level parallel programming tools, you know, you trade off uh, productivity against performance because using, you know, sort of the, you know, native threading APIs or, uh, you know, low-level vector intrinsics for a particular architecture is, is relatively low productivity, even you know, from a pure line count point of view, but just in general, it's, a, it's not a very widely acquired skill. Um, so um, you can manage that, of course, and we see people doing this now by restricting the domain of applicability. So data parallel languages are one way of restricting things, but that's not quite domain-specific, right? You're sort of narrowing applicability to a particular pattern or, or structure of parallelism. Uh, and, but just in doing that, right, you get sort of, uh, with a programming model that's, you know, um, still relatively high level, pretty good performance. Uh, if you narrow it even further to, you know, say just image processing <coughs> or graphics, you know, you can do more. In fact, you can, you know, you bring to bear these domain-specific optimizations that get you a ton of performance. And we see this in, you know, shader compiler uh, implementation for architectures like Larrabee. Um, so you can sort of use, you know, domain specificity as a, as a knob to, you know, to, you know, close that window between productivity and performance. And that's one reason it's interesting. And, you know, I think one reason we're seeing, you know, these little, you know, offshoots of, of new languages that um, are uh, important to a particular vertical. Um, now, the other thing, another, the other factor here, again, as I, as I mentioned earlier, multi-language development seems a lot more um, palatable to people. And if I, you know, for, for high performance in this one piece of uh, my program, if I use um, uh, a domain-specific <coughs> language um, to sort of productively implement that and have, you know, maintainable, readable code that, that's, that's really high performance, but use, you know, whatever, you know, Windows, uh, you, know, um, you know, interface, uh, um, uh, classes for my user interface somewhere else, um, that's fine. You know, people are perfectly comfortable doing that. 
Uh, so it kind of makes you know the the stigma attached to you know what might be perceived as a niche language kind of uh, uh, diminished a bit. The other um, side of this, and I'll talk a little bit more about um, this piece. I, I think they're somewhat related, uh, but you know the other side of this is sort of um, you know between libraries and languages, we're sort of blurring the lines here. You know, C++ and other object-oriented languages, for better or worse, have really made it possible for us to introduce sort of language-like extensions to uh, standard C++, right, to standard, you know, or you know, C Sharp and, and Java. Um, so you can introduce semantics and, um, you know, constructs that behave like uh, first-class, um, you know, features of the language. Uh, and in doing that, you know, you, you end up seeing people doing things like developing uh, what look like language extensions that are domain specific, right? And I'll show you a couple of examples of this, one in more detail than, uh, than the other. Uh, but, you know, you could kind of look at this trend as, um, you know, people don't fear sort of use of domain specific languages and or frameworks um, to the extent that, you know, now those frameworks look a lot more like language extensions. Um, and, you know, the attractive thing about this is as, as the standards have evolved, um, you know, that it, um, it makes it more attractive. It, it reduces yet another sort of barrier to adoption in that, you know, well, I can compile it with GCC, ICC, and Visual C++, then I'm happy. Um, so a couple of examples. I'll talk about Quantlib a bit more later. Um, our ITK, this Insight um, uh, Segmentation Registration Toolkit, CTL, which is a color, um, color transformation library and, and Quantlib, which are these, you know, sort of um, high-level, you know, sort of generic, you know, highly modularized interfaces for people to do, you know, very domain-specific kinds of uh, programming. Um, and you have, you know, these template metaprogram libs like um, ublos, other linear algebra libs that use things like expression templates to do, you know, you know, static compile time transformation of expressions and optimization. And then, uh, you know, what we're doing with CT is a sort of, you know, generative programming approach with, you know, dynamic metaprogramming that I'll describe. So um, I'll get into the library stuff in a minute, but I wanted to make this uh, sort of observation about productivity specifically in relation to throughput computing or, you know, kind of what we're calling, you know, this segment of high-performance computing now that's a little bit broader than traditional scientific computing. Um, when we, and we talk to folks in, um, you know, in, in imaging and video processing and um, financial analytics uh, and other domains where this is true. So you have this sort of traditional product life cycle you think of where, you know, depending on the company, you know, you have, uh, uh, once you get sort of an implementation plan, it's, you know, 12 to 18 months in the tunnel and, uh, you know, before shipping, uh, you know, sort of the, the you know, the, the, the beta or the gold version of your, of your product. Um, and sort of, you know, research and, you know, and algorithms and next generation technology is, is somewhat limited, right? It happens either at very coarse granularity or not at all because you're, you're being driven by market requirements in terms of your feature set. In throughput computing, of course, there's more science there, right? There's more math and computation uh, that you care about in terms of, you know, developing that next generation technology because that's the stuff that's going to scale. Um, what we find is that there's this kind of, you know, extended life cycle. Um, You'll have, you know, a quant or a color scientist sitting somewhere thinking up sort of the next enhancement to this, uh, to this, to this thing that they're doing, a, a pricing model that's deployed or uh, an image processing pipeline that's shipped. Uh, and they'll use something like, I don't know, MATLAB or Mathematica or CTL or whatever to, to sort of, you know, develop the algorithm, characterize it, and use that as a specification to throw over the wall to, to some group of people that go and, and do performance tuning on this thing and, you know, generate a C version of this and maybe, you know, put it into a common framework that's used by a, a product development team or multiple product development teams. Um, and then, you know, you'll have sort of the, you know, either I, the developers or, you know, some field, um, uh, field developer. <coughs> so, for example, in financial analytics, you might have someone who's sitting at a training desk who's actually using some core library. Uh, in, um, in gaming, um, you might have sort of a, a game engine uh, architecture and then you're sort of tuning for all the different platforms they care about, and in particular, you know, PC and consoles, and there's three different consoles. Um, so there's this long transition then to sort of get it, you know, out, right? Get it either integrated into a product uh, or, you know, shipped as a, uh, a shrink-wrapped game, for example. Um, so it really stretches out sort of the, the time to features, new features that are being developed, uh, 
to them making it out into the marketplace. And what that means for you know, us as a, uh, as a semiconductor company is that um, that stretches the time <laughs> from when products are um, thought about uh, or features for products are thought about in the context of our, you know, our processors that are, that are coming out, the, the new things that we're adding. Um, it stretches out the time uh, between you know, that happening and um, you know, those, those features in our processors being taken advantage of, right? If we're shipping something next year, say, you know, AVX-enabled processors that you know, opens up a new capability, uh, we don't want it to take you know, two to three years for it to make it to market. And you know, in a lot of places, it's, um, you know, there's a sort of you know, feedback loop, right? You know, there's, uh, in the case of financial analytics, oftentimes you know, these you know, sort of models are used by developers who are using you know, things like Visual Basic to sort of glue things together and uh, you know, price things at, uh, at, a, you know, at an Excel-based front end at, uh, at the trader's desk. And, um, you know, in the field, it's not uncommon for people to develop new usages, right, that were unanticipated by, by the quants. And that may be driven by market forces, it may be driven by, uh, you know, the development of a particular, uh, you know, sort of game technology. You know, it depends on your segment. And so there's a sort of feedback where, you know, again, you know, there's some team or collection of teams that are refactoring sort of the performance parts of this code and, you know, uh, taking into account new usages and the sort of chain, you know, recurs. So, um, you know, what we'd really like to see is, um, as one of several chip vendors that's selling highly parallel processors, is to sort of get rid of this, um, this middle section here, where we can sort of just toss out this, um, you know, the middleman here between high productivity and high performance. Uh, and in particular, you know, we want um, developers who are working in high productivity tools um, to be able to get high performance right out of that. That is, the, the specification of the algorithm should be fairly close to the implementation that gets performance. Um, and this may be, you know, this may be a function of supporting a, uh, you know, high-level mathematical language or scripting language, or it may be, you know, based on some higher-level framework or toolkit like, you know, the Insight Toolkit or Quantlib or something like that. Um, so that's, that's, that's our basic aim and, you know, from a, you know, it's an interesting research topic in its own right, but there are actually things that we can do today, that we are doing today, that can, that can really close this gap. So now I want to return back to the C++ developer. So, you know, you start talking about you know, scripting languages and, you know, domain-specific languages, libraries, and so on, you know, people's eyes start to glaze over. And uh, if they're, they're C++ developers, and a lot of developers are C++ developers. And, um, you know, one of the, uh, <coughs> you know, why does this matter to C++ developers? Well, you know, again, in coming from HPC, you tend to think of things in terms of a single kernel, right? If, um, you know, if I optimize this kernel, you know, this is the critical path of my program, and I'll get, you know, untold benefits of, of parallelism out of this. Um, but, you know, if you, you know, you end up putting, you know, an enormous amount of effort into tuning a single kernel, right? If you've, I don't know if you've ever taken, I don't know, classic exercise to take DGEM and, you know, write a really highly tuned algorithm, uh, uh, rendition of that for a particular architecture, you know, leveraging microarchitectural knowledge, you know, doing locality optimizations, you know, maybe even hand scheduling uh, assembly and, and so on. Uh, and it's, you know, it's, um, you know, a couple of orders of magnitude more time than, uh, than just writing high level C code, for example. Um, so if you, you know, that's fine if you have one thing and you're going to reuse that thing, um, but, you know, increasingly <coughs> that's not the case, right? If you, and, and I'll explain why in a minute, but if you, you know, if you have uh, code sort of dispersed everywhere, um, you're going to be better off getting, you know, 50% of peak performance on the 20 places where performance matters versus, you know, one of the 20 places getting 100% of peak performance. Uh, so, you know, uh, what that really means is that you're going to have to sort of focus your effort everywhere um, to really make up for that, uh, that dispersal of, of performance. So the reason that happens is that, um, you know, there's been this sort of never-ending um, trend toward, uh, you know, increased modularity in software development, you know, in particular for developing a framework that you want people to use. And, um, you know, outside of your organization or even within your organization, you may have multiple customers, right, that are using your, uh, your tool or your library. Um, you tend to design, you know, very abstracted, you know, generic interfaces. Um, and, 
uh, well, well, they're nice and they're great and they get, they're really powerful because you can sort of, you know, uh, mix and match um, different types of uh, <laughs> objects and algorithms. Um, they um, are, you know, they tend to be the opposite of what traditional performance tools want to get performance. Uh, and so that's, that's problematic and that's true in C++, C++ libraries and a lot of C++ code that we look at. In fact, if you look back at, at this picture, um, we've heard from game developers the, um, you know, this exercise here of performance tuning is essentially transposing out the performance paths from, you know, this, this well-architected piece of software. You know, sort of undoing, you know, all the, you know, a lot of the architecting that, that people have done. And that's, uh, it's not just unproductive in the near term, it's, it has long-term impact on the maintainability and stability of, of, your, of your software. So, um, so you know, you know, nice interfaces, you know, tend to be uh, uh, at odds with, and I'll quantify that in the case of, of, of uh, Quantlib in a minute, uh, tend to be at odds with, with performance. Um, but, you know, it's nice to have sort of late binding and parameter generality and these kinds of things. Um, so, you know, Quantlib is this, um, I'll show you a little uh, set of signatures on a couple of slides, but this library that, um, is open source and it's a uh, it's a package that lets you sort of you know build complex financial um, uh, instruments and price them and use different algorithms to to model um, uh, to model you know risk and and um, you know uh, price based on risk um, and you know it's really you know you can do a lot of lot of things with it but the um, the, the problem is, as you'll see, if you, if you look at a you know, simple algorithm like binomial tree option pricing, which is you know, a particular algorithm for a particular kind of option, um, that, uh, um, and it's a fairly simple structure, that the performance impact can be uh, uh, significant. I mean, an order of magnitude slower than just sort of the transposed out C code. And you know, essentially what's happening is that you have this you know, kind of well-architected software here you know, where you're, you're kind of, uh, you know, you know, you know, perhaps some, some generic object, uh, uh, option object is, you know, referring to some uh, generic algorithm or instantiated with a generic algorithm to compute the price. And the performance path ends up being sort of dispersed through, you know, through the, um, you know, the virtual functions in there. And it's really hard for a C++ compiler, even a really good C++ compiler where we do class analysis and aggressive inlining and aggressive alias analysis to sort of figure this out and find these performance paths. So what happens is you end up, and I'll show you in a minute what that looks like, you end up sort of just, you know, looking at sort of the combinatorial, you know, you know set of paths that, that go through all these different uh, potential performance paths. In the case of Quantlib here, here's a, an actual example of, uh, of the interface. You know, you have, you know, different kinds of, uh, of uh, financial instruments you're looking at. You have, um, uh, you know, generic classes for these. Uh, and then, you know, subclasses for specific uh, flavors. Uh, you have different um, uh, algorithms for, for computing these. Um, and you can, you know, parameterize it by, you know, a number of, of these that you're doing at your pricing at the same time. Uh, so it's, it's really flexible, right? Um, but uh, again, as, as you'll see, it's um, uh, significant overhead to, uh, to use this library. Uh, and uh, uh, I'll show you why, why CT actually does a, a better job of this. So, um, just to return to sort of that, you know, iconic rendition of what's going on, um, we actually see this, right? We see people who take their code and then, you know, sort of specialize it by, you know, essentially manually transposing out these, these performance paths, you know, sort of generating all possible combinations and generating sort of specialized, you know, flattened versions of these, uh, of these algorithms. Uh, but the problem is, is that that code ends up being, you know, incredibly brittle and, you know, difficult to maintain, it's difficult to extend, because if you extend it, you have to sort of, you know, you know blow out the number of uh, combinations you're looking at. Um, and, um, you know, it's difficult to program, of course, right? You've lost all the sort of the programmability benefits uh, associated with, uh, uh, you know, with the modularity of the original design. So, um, so what I'll talk about with CT is, uh, is, a, is a mechanism that lets you, instead of sort of, you know, taking these paths and, you know, pulling them out, you can kind of leave, you know, a trail of breadcrumbs, right? You know, put little bits of CT code here um, throughout your, um, your virtual functions that you're calling. And, uh, you know, 
CT will take care of sort of doing that kind of specialization on the fly for you. Um, and essentially, it looks like this, this generative programming technique. But you know, what we're doing is you know, dynamic compilation through, uh, you know, through specific instances of, uh, of your, uh, of your um, object hierarchy. So what happens is, when you look at performance, um, in this case, is that uh, if you look at sort of the you know, quant lib baseline with, you know, compiled by Microsoft <coughs> Visual Studio, um, you know, we're using that as sort of our baseline performance here, right? Um, if you took the, that and you just flattened it, if you forget about using, you know, parallel constructs, using CT, whatever, if you just sort of did what I referred to earlier, you know, sort of the transposing out or the flattening of the, of the performance paths, um, you know, you get a 10x performance boost, right? You know, in this case, that's the modularity tax, right? Well-designed software, in this case, costs you 10x of, uh, uh, 10x of your performance. So, um, and you know, and, and that's, you know, again, that's a particular path and hard to maintain, but if you use sort of the, the approach that I described earlier, of sort of just peppering these, these, um, um, uh, these virtual functions with, with calls to CT, um, you can keep the code in its original structure and get much better performance. In fact, you know, we are, um, you know, in the serial case, you know, slightly better than uh, uh, the um, completely flattened plain C version because our, you know, probably because our, uh, our uh, code generator is a, a little bit better than Visual Studio's. And that's a dynamic code generator. Uh, but we, we scale reasonably well too. Um, and we haven't sacrificed the structure of the code. Uh, you, know, you still have this nice generic interface and uh, you can do, uh, you get the full power of that uh, from the perspective of experimenting with different methods for uh, <coughs> modeling a particular financial instrument, but you get the performance you'd get uh, if you, you know, took that version, uh, inlined it for a special case, and hand optimized it. So, how does that work? So this part, I'll talk a little bit about CT now, and uh, how um, this kind of infrastructure, in general, can <coughs> really help with, um, you know, sort of the modularity tax you find in, in you know, object-oriented uh, class design uh, or interface design, but also uh, can help with um, looking at scripting languages and domain-specific languages uh, that have, you know, other kinds of tax. Uh, but that are also related to late binding and, and the flexibility that you get out of um, generic programming and polymorphic interfaces. So, before I start there, I just want to um, let you know that you can ask me questions at any time. Uh, you don't have to wait till the end. I'll, I'll take questions so as I go. So, please. Going back to the, the previous slide, so why the break in two threads instead of uh, Yeah, we're getting... Um, yeah, it's funny. You'd expect on, on core quad that, that the break would be at, at four cores. Um, I, think, I think it's because we're not doing very good locality optimizations. In fact, there's, there's in our implementation of, um, or in the implementation of binomial tree, um, you sort of extract this generic version. And in terms of compiling it, you can, um, you can sort of do this, uh, if you look at sort of the, the way the lattice you know, breaks out, you can deal with it a couple of ways. You can sort of, you know, um, you know, look at a bunch of options and then sort of serially execute on each, right? Sort of that data parallel approach and use a lane of a vector unit and, and cores to sort of deal with each um, degree of parallelism. You can also block it as well. You know, you can sort of start tiling at the sort of the, you know, within the lattice. And we've been doing some work there to drive some of our locality optimizations. In our case, our lo locality optimizations aren't terribly mature. So I think when we start, um, uh, scaling up the core count, um, we're not really optimizing for the increased pressure on, on cache size here. But scaling up core count in our case means scaling up the number of threads that we're, that we're using. And we don't adjust uh, uh, the per thread working set sizes as, uh, as we probably should. Yeah, I, I don't think it's an in any inherent limitation of the architecture for, for core Core i7, i5, et cetera, anything from the Nehalem family, we've, um, uh, algorithms where we've previously seen, previously seen sort of memory bottlenecks like, you know, sparse matrix related algorithms that have been greatly improved by moving to QPI. Uh, 
Okay, so what is CT technology? Um, it's a C++ library, uh, but it's a little bit more than that, and I'll describe sort of what's underneath the surface, because that'll be uh, relevant when we talk about uh, supporting other kinds of languages. Um, looks like, you know, works with standard C++ compilers, so we validate on ICC, uh, Visual C++, and GCC. Um, essentially looks like a, a library that's adding some parallel collection objects uh, and operators on those objects to, um, to C++. Um, it's fairly high level. I'll show you some samples later, but um, it's fairly high level. We don't um, expose things like vector ISO width, are you on four wide SSE, eight wide AVX, 16 wide layer. <coughs> it's, it's irrelevant as far as the high level model goes. Uh, and um, we don't expose core count. The memory model, let me be specific about what I mean by that. Whether you're operating on a sort of a, you know, um, sort of a uniform virtual address space or in two different um, disjoint address spaces as you might in a Larrabee system. Um, that's hidden from you, so the same piece of code will just work, uh, will seamlessly deal with uh, any kind of uh, uh, memory uh, mapping that has to happen in a Larrabee offload. And cache sizes, so we do locality optimizations uh, for you. Um, they're somewhat immature at this point, but um, uh, we will do them. You can also manually, explicitly block if you if you like as well. The idea is that you know we're expressing computation at a high level, you know, sort of at the level of the notation of the math almost, right? That you're that you want to you want to implement the computation. So you know you focus on what to do, not how to do it. So it's more declarative in in spirit than uh, languages that have uh, introduced a lot of uh, syntax or uh, nomenclature around. Um, managing parallelism. And, you know, uh, for the API, it's, um, the semantics are that it's execution and uh, single thread are the same, is the same as execution <coughs> on multiple threads. So uh, if you read the code, it's, it's, it's got a sequential semantics to it. So it's a little bit easier to understand than a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of the more sort of explicitly parallel models. We've designed it to forward scale software written today, so it's um, dynamically compiled, and that has benefits for, as, I, as I've talked about earlier actually, uh, for more than just uh, retargeting to hardware. Um, but that's one of the motivations for dynamic compilation. That is, you know, you can ship a product uh, never having seen an AVX um, based processor, and then when we ship, you know, Sandy Bridge um, processors, we'll, there'll be a new, um, uh, uh, DLL for, for CT you can grab that'll automatically use AVX underneath your application. So sort of instant enabling, which is important to us too at Intel. We want people using these features as they come out. A, a lot of the peak performance is in, um, is in these instructions that we're, we're adding. Uh, in fact, if I take a little diversion here, if you look at where we're, you know, um, if, you, if you look at AVX or Larabee and I, if you don't use vector instructions, you're not using, you know, north or south of 90% of, of the peak flops of the system. So it's important for you, the developer, but also for us, Intel, to, that, that people use these instructions. And, you know, they are richer and more usable, you know, than um, you know, sort of, you know, the, the earlier uh, subsets of, of SSE where you had to sort of jump out of vector instructions quite a bit and that mitigated the performance gain you got out of SSE. Um, it's actually, they're, they're fairly rich and, and useful. Um, and then CT is safe by default. So if you use CT, um, there are determinism guarantees uh, that are provided, uh, but you can override those for performance. So you know, in our experience, there's a, a sort of a, a trade-off between determinism and um, and performance. And for example, uh, CT has a managed heap, and so if you um, create a, a collection in CT uh, and you know want it to um, use the data from a CRA. By default, we will copy the data from the CRA into the heap, um, but without, you know, so there's an expense of a copy there uh, that many developers will want to avoid. So we have these mechanisms for you to override these protections uh, progressively. So for example, if you don't want to do that copy, you can just, you know, you can just create an in-place bind to a CRA and then we'll just use the data allocated for the CRA, you know, and then, you know, a memory allocated for the CRA we won't copy. Um, the nice thing about that is you don't need to change your code uh, of your core algorithm. You just 
change sort of the binding construct at the at the boundaries of the of the CT code. And there, there's a bunch of different options you have here. In fact, you can go down to the metal, as I'll as I'll point out in a minute. Um, so there's different kinds of parallel collections, and um, if we had uh, a ton of time, um, we could get down into the nitty gritty details of the runtime uh, to sort of describe how we how we support these because it's. It's, it's actually fascinating. It's, it's fairly extensible, and we're, we're looking at ways to expose that extensibility to programmers. So if you want to define your own special type and tell us how to generate code for it at a relatively high level, we can sort of grok that and, and support you know, whatever new type you decide to add. So, so the core types that we build in are you know, one, two, and three-dimensional um, VEX, these things we call VEX. Uh, and you know, we support you know, collections of, of these primitive types, like you know, floats and doubles and so on, but also uh, of uh, you know, short arrays or tuples. Uh, um, so you could have a you know, 2D vec of, uh, of you know, three 8-bit you know, integers and, or 8-bit unsigned integers to represent an image, for example. Um, we also have these irregular um, structures, um, nested vecs, which are um, you know, kind of like ragged arrays. Uh, if you're familiar with Guy Blalock's work, they're segmented vectors, um, useful for a lot of uh, irregular data structures, um, or as a building block for a lot of irregular data structures, and indexed um, vectors, which are basically just you know, value key associations. So if you're used to using um, something like MapReduce, where you have sort of value key associations, it's the same thing, basically. Um, and more. And so again, you know, we've architected the runtime so that we can um, grow the number of built-in types. Uh, uh, and in fact, we may eventually expose that where we're looking at sort of, you can build sparse you know, matrix structures, for example, on these types, but there's some domain knowledge you can take advantage in terms of optimization if you actually build it into the runtime. So we're looking at uh, adding you know, first class you know, one, two dimensional sparse types, uh, as well as you know, just arbitrary you know, high dimensional vex as well. Um, I'll talk about how to express parallelism uh, on these things. I, I want to point out there's a fairly rich set of uh, primitives that let you sort of, you know, permute data here. Um, you know, grabbing, you know, column or row or page and, you know, repeating it or just extracting it and you know, doing data reordering, either completely unstructured, you know, scatter gather or, um, you know, more structured, uh, you know, things like shifts and rotations with boundary condition. Um, you know, dealing with boundary conditions in, in reasonable ways. Um, but, you know, there's, you know, so those are the types and sort of things you can do to them in terms of, um, you know, uh, shape transformations. Um, what's really useful is doing computation on those types. So there's a couple of different ways we support uh, operations on, on these collections. One is just using sort of a, um, uh, an array syntax style. So if I, you know, if I say, you know, I have a, a collection, you know, B and C, and I, you know, divide those two. I'm basically saying this is an element-wise divide between elements of B and C. If I do a multiply, it's an element-wise multiply. So these are just collections, right? They're not linear algebra multiplies, right? This isn't a, um, it's, if you're a MATLAB user, it's a star dot, not a star. <laughs> um, and all these operations are implicitly parallel, and the runtime um, will go in and, you know, sort of, you know, rather than sort of, you know, parallelize each of these individual operations, which would be, you know, ridiculous from a performance point of view, we'll go in and sort of fuse these things together and create coarser grain chunks of work. And this is, you know, if you're, if you're familiar with, you know, Fortran extensions or APL or, you know, any of those kinds of, you know, array syntax oriented kinds of models, this will be very comfortable. And, and if you're, you're doing a lot of sort of global data movement and, and permutation, this is also really convenient. Um, Another way that you can use in a uh, CT program is this sort of scalar syntax style. So you can just specify what you want to do at every element. So here's the same computation that I'm doing over there, but I'm going to say, you know, at each, you know, element of this vec, I'm just going to, you know, evaluate this expression. And then I'm going to map that to, to these collections. And this is kind of nice because, um, you know, it's uh, the way, first of all, it's the way that a lot of people who come from the graphics side of things think. You know, they think in terms of, you know, shader programs and, you know, a scalar program that defines what happens at each element and then just map it, right? Um, but beyond that, it it's actually has some uh, <coughs> advantages in terms of ease of use. So if you had any kind of control flow here, like a, 
you know, like a conditional or a while loop, break, continue, for loop, whatever. Um, in that case, the programmer would have to manually sort of vectorize that, right? They'd have to figure out how to vectorize a conditional. The upside of doing that is that the programmer would um, have uh, absolute control over how that happens, right? So for, ex for example, imagine you're in a while loop and you're doing some data parallel computation uh, and on, you know, a while loop on each element. Well, if every, everything sort of, you know, you know, exits the while loop at the same time, then you might as well just sort of wait till everyone's done, right? But if you have sort of a really high, um, you know, margin uh, between um, things that might exit early and things that might exit late, at certain points you might want to pack data down. And you can sort of explicitly control that in the uh, vector syntax case. In this case, you just write the while loop in your scalar code and we'll take care of it for you. So we'll go in and, and you know, parallelize and vectorize that for you using a, a reasonable strategy, but not one that you explicitly control here. We may add a facility to say, well, you know, the distribution of you know, trip counts here is this, and then we'll pick the strategy according to that. But um, the idea here is just you know, simplicity. The other thing you're sort of restricted from in this, in this kind of scalar syntax is um, sort of expressing permutations, reductions, and, and so on. Right? So here you can just do an add reduce or uh, a scan or, or whatever in the, in, the, um, in the vector syntax. But in the, um, you know, the scalar syntax, you, know, you, you kind of have, uh, you can access your neighboring elements, for example. So if you're doing some kind of convolution or a stencil computation more generally, you can sort of you know, talk to, you know, access the guy above you, to the right of you, to the left of you, behind you, in front of you, and so on. Um, but uh, you can't sort of, you know, uh, do a shuffle of two vectors, for example. I mean, you could, but the performance wouldn't be so great. Here, by abstracting sort of the, the um, permutations as higher level operators, we actually know a lot more about them and can do, um, you know, much more optimization. And then a third way is to allow developers to write their own, you know, completely unmanaged, um, you know, uh, unsafe, you know, uh, code that'll touch our data structures. Uh, and uh, so this, 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 this thing is, is something we call the native interface. And the idea is that um, if you want to get down to the metal for, you know, a particular kernel, you can. Or more often, if you have some legacy library you want to use, you don't want to just throw it away and completely rewrite it, you can. You can use the native interface for that. Um, we actually use this internally to expose some MKL libraries, right? So for example, we don't just provide a, um, this sort of, you know, um, uh, this general interface, but also, you know, linear algebra libraries, FFTs, random number generation, and so on. And we'll use sort of these, you know, very highly optimized implementations that our, you know, Intel math kernel library team will develop, you know, behind the scenes for, for those libraries using this, um, this native interface. The nice thing is you can sort of, um, you know, while the CT runtime sort of, you know, conceptually, you know, automates this transformation, developers can pick and choose what they want throughout their application. You're not sort of in one mode or the other. You can use that in one place, you know, array syntax in another, you know, native interfaces in another. You can freely mix them. So you have sort of maximal flexibility in terms of the style of data parallelism you, you want to use. Question. Yes. Can you cover exception handling? No, but I'll say something about it. Um, so we um, don't. Um, so the model is that we'll rethrow exceptions at um, at the sort of the C++ context outside of uh, of CT code. Within CT code, there's no way to sort of throw an exception. Exceptions may get thrown because of some system exception or you know the floating point issue or whatever that comes up, right? Uh, and we'll catch them and then rethrow them at the C++ context. So you can wrap your CT code in a try catch, for example. In native code, you can throw an exception, and the runtime mechanism intercepts them and then rethrows them at the outer layer. Uh, in the order that they would have occurred sequentially. But we don't get any more sophisticated than that. <coughs> we just strive to be consistent with what you'd get in, uh, in a C++ program. Actually, when I talk about the next part, uh, the sort of the implementation, um, that's one of the challenges in terms of extending the applicability of the runtime to other languages is accommodating other exception models and, um, uh, you know, sort of things on the fringes of the language development. So do you think of sort of CT programming as being, you know, uh, in, in two modes, right? Either you're in the your generic C++ mm -hmm. uh, 
algorithm and then you go into CT and then you come back or uh, how fine grained uh, do you make you, CT you, versus, you know? You can actually go back and forth at a pretty fine grain. Um, so for example, um, you could, uh, those breadcrumbs I talked about, little pieces, little fragments of CT code that you intersperse throughout could be just a single expression, right? And, you know, it's really sort of the composition of, or the, the execution path through your, um, you know, your library or application that, that builds up the piece of code that you're, um, uh, that you're going to compile in CT. Uh, the, the trick is, though, I, and I think this is sort of where you're going, is that, you know, you want to be able to... Um, um, we presume that there's a, you know, a, a significant performance path somewhere in the code. And if you look at the target applications that we care about in you know, medical imaging and fina finance and physics and so on, you know, that, that ends up being true. It's just sort of dispersed everywhere. Um, and you know, if, so if we can find that and it's you know, a big enough chunk of work, then we can do a pretty good job of compiling and optimizing it and, and generating code. Um, there is, there are, there is a, uh, a little bit of an art to sort of placing those entry points into where you start building stuff up and where you invoke it. It's not that complicated. In fact, um, uh, we're releasing a beta fairly soon. In a beta update that's coming, we're, we're actually making, providing more controls over when you do compilation. So you can say, this is where you compile. Here's a closure that you can then sort of just stuff away in a program object in your class, you know, and then, then reuse multiple times. Um, okay, so this will be the last sort of, you know, marketing slide. Uh, you know, so you could use um, CT technology in your favorite environment. So we have IDE integration. Uh, we're, we're shipping a beta in um, just a matter of weeks uh, for Windows. Um, Linux and Mac OS X will come, Linux will come shortly after that, and Mac OS X will be somewhere next year. Um, we have IDE integration on Windows with um, Visual Studio, um, interoperability with um, TBB and um, VTune, and um, you know, some custom plugins that let you sort of visualize data in, in a natural way. So instead of just looking at a matrix of numbers, you can, you know, if it's an image, render the image, you know, that kind of thing. So there's basic kind of, uh, you know, nice, you know, integration points that let you debug in, 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 uh, in an idiom that's uh, native to the dev application you're developing. On the Linux side, we're, we're, uh, we're using Eclipse as our sort of um, standard IDE that we're building integration into. Although on Linux, you know, the uh, standard IDE is a little bit of an oxymoron. So let me show you some more complex um, examples of code. Uh, it's a little bit blurry on the screen here, but um, this is a, um, an order six stencil for um, uh, for a PDE solver. Um, on the left here, you're looking at the, the C code, and um, while you squint your eyes, I'll just describe it for you. So it's a three-dimensional volume that you're, you're performing the stencil through. It's essentially a three-dimensional filter, um, seven points on a dimension. So pretty straightforward. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the main part of the filter is, is right here, right? So you're a couple of, couple of dimensions up, down, right, left, forward, and backwards. Uh, for this, and you'll do this. Uh, you'll do this. Um, you'll tend to do this kind of thing iteratively. So, um, what I want to just sort of highlight here um, is how you transform this into CT code. And in this, in this case, what we're going to use is that scalar syntax because it lends itself to that. It's a very local computation. The only sort of you know non-local stuff you're accessing are, are neighboring elements. So here, if you look at CT code, here's a here's a just a C++ function that represents the the CT version, and um, you know, the the body, the loops go away, right? Because everything is sort of implicitly, you know, happening over the entire collection. In this case, a, a 3D vec that you end up calling, mapping this onto, uh, and um, you're just, you know, performing the same sort of computation here, except now you're just, you know, performing it on a particular element or using relative indexing neighbors of that element, right? So you're saying, you know, um, you know. I'm going to do. I'm going to use the value that I'm applied to, but also I'm going to grab some some values around me using this sort of relative indexing here. And um, you know, in some ways, the code is is simpler to read because you don't have to deal with sort of the. And this is an artifact of just you know, C arrays, but you don't have to deal with the um, uh, 
uh, complex uh, <laughs> index computation there. Um, but you also uh, don't have to deal with something that I left out here, which is dealing with boundary conditions. So we deal with boundary conditions automatically. In fact, out of bounds values will be filled in by either a, um, either a zero of the appropriate type or um, a default value you specify, or you can have um, um, rotation semantics where you sort of wrap around, wrap around semantics. Um, and so you just take this this kernel, this function, and then R map it to, to, your, to your data. We have two VEC3Ds declared here, your input data and your output data. We've bound them here. This is the binding operator that just does the computation in place to two C arrays, give the dimensions, and you're, and you're done. You're ready to go. So here's an example where we're using sort of the vector syntax. And uh, this is a medical imaging application. Um, it's a back, proje back projection uh, algorithm for um, uh, reconstructing, you know, based on, um, uh, you know, receivers in a, in a, um, in a nuclear uh, imaging system, um, reconstructing what the, um, uh, the rays you cast pass through. Uh, so here you see that we're, we're sort of iterating over, you know, receivers on the, you know, on the boundary of, uh, of, um, of the device, of the sensor, uh, and then, you know, iterating over, you know, over, you know, a bunch of angles you might be receiving these rays from. Um, when you sort of CTFI hit, uh, CTFI it here, um, the, the outer two loops, right, where you're sort of iterating over the, the data points you might be uh, passing through, um, those go away, right, because you're now using sort of these 2D data types where sort of the, you know, that control flow, that, that, computation over each element is implicit. Um, you still have this loop here, and you have this funny notation, this underscore four. The reason you have that is that this, this tells us that this is a dynamic four, that this, this is, when you see how we generate code, right, we're essentially using this generative programming technique to sort of spit out what happened, and then optimize it, compile it, and run it. Um, for us to know whether this is, you know, sort of a, um, you know, sort of you know, construction time piece of control flow versus something that you want to be part of that generated program, um, you use this sort of special uh, control flow here. In fact, there's a synonym for this called dynamic four to make it more explicit, but for readability, I, we have a, <laughs> we shorten it to underscore four. Um, and then in the body of the loop, you're just basically using these element-wise operators here you know, um, subtract, uh, you know, standard math library functions, et cetera, and actually a 2D um, gather operation, two 2D gather operations here. So it looks like, you know, a bunch of, you know, array expressions, and when we optimize this, it all gets turned into a single coarse grain task with vectorized code inside it. So we don't have, you know, whatever, 20 different, you know, tasks that get spawned off, or regions of tasks, fork join regions, just one fork join that happens here. So one of the things we've been working on recently, just that's a fairly, well, unfortunately, you've lost the value of this particular <laughs> image here. <laughs> but um, what, you know, back projection's a, a pretty um, run-of-the-mill kind of uh, medical imaging algorithm. We've been doing work in, um, in contrast optical flow, so deformable image registration. So one of the problems that comes up in um, certain kinds of medical imaging, especially um, uh, breast cancer screening is that you're taking a series of shots uh, and you have, you know, motion in the patient and you have to sort of, you know, register, but, you know, the, the motion is of a deformable body, not just sort of a, a shift, right? Uh, so we've been um, looking at algorithms using uh, this sort of optical flow algorithm. One of the standards, uh, not standards, but one of the very popular toolkits that people use is this thing called the um, Insight um, uh, registration and segmentation toolkit uh, that, um, you know, m makes it possible for people to sort of experiment with this, but the performance isn't very good. It has the same sort of modularity tax that I referred to earlier for Quantlib. Um, so uh, in this case, we can show that um, uh, we get, uh, if we go and sort of parallelize, manually parallelize ITK, versus using the technique of sort of leaving these little breadcrumbs of, of CT around, you know, preserving the original structure, uh, 
um, we can be 2x faster than, um, than the ITK implementation. And you know, one of the challenges here is really getting this to be you know, sort of fast enough that you can do, um, that you can do this sort of um, uh, you know, lesion identification and so on um, you know, quickly in a screen. Um, on top of this, you can do you know, additional, you know, that's just sort of a baseline you know, implementation of this. You know, we've been doing experiments with um, you know, algorithmic improvements to this that give us even more significant speedups with uh, no loss of uh, fidelity in the, um, in the reconstructed, uh, reconstructed image. Question? Yes. In the medical domain, don't you run into certification issues because yes. you certify the code and then it's not the code? Yeah, well, you run into certification issues with uh, finance as well. <laughs> uh, so, uh, oh, but in one case, pardon me. In one case, you get thrown in jail, in the other case, you just lose a bunch of money. Yeah, no. So there are ways. Of, I mean, so the the issue tip, typically tends to deal has to do with um, being able to certify the code that you're running. And so the question is, you know, if you're always um, in these domains, if you're always dynamically compiling, then, then you might run into some trouble. You actually have that problem, for example, on um, game console hardware, right? They tend to restrict uh, dynamic, uh, dynamically generated code. But you can actually, so we, we actually cache code <laughs> when we compile. Uh, and uh, um, that code cache doesn't have to be a, um, a sort of a transient thing per run. It can actually persist on disk, and in fact, uh, we'll have, uh, in a beta update, we'll have just a mechanism where you can just sort of write the object and reload it. So when you ship an application, you can also ship the pre-compiled object and that certify that and always run that, you know, for, for this kind of application. But you still sort of close that productivity gap. It's just when you ship the thing, you're not really going to take advantage of, you know, geez, I'm going to plug a new, in this kind of system, you wouldn't just plug a new piece of hardware into it and say, okay, adapt to that. You know, you'd, you'd, uh, it's a different, different game. So how does it really work? Um, so CT is a high-level API, uh, and if you look at the headers, you can see that it's basically this you know, C++ front end set of classes that's streaming um, these opcodes, these, these essentially bytecode uh, encoded um, operations to a virtual machine, which is you know, encoded in the, today in the C DLL shared object interface. Um, and in fact, that front end doesn't have to be a set of C++ header files. It could be um, a new language, you know, compiler for a new language, a bytecode parser. And you know, we've done, I'll mention this again later, we've done um, experiments with Python and HLSL. Uh, an application-specific library, if you want to sort of bypass the C++ interface and go directly to uh, the VM, you can. Or a static compiler front end. So the way it works is, this animation is a little bit broken, I'll just blow it out, is that uh, if you grab a copy of CT, you see, you know, the first thing you see is sort of the CT API, the, all the, you know, C++ stuff that I've showed you that you can use. But there's also this VM interface that's, um, that's, that you can take a look at as well, right, that's available to you and you can sort of, you know, drive um, operators into. And that's really intended for the language implementer. Um, there's also a lower level interface. I won't talk about much here. Uh, but a lower level interface in our, you know, what we sort of loosely call our hardware abstraction layer in our stack that um, allows us to sort of target um, these, um, these different microarchitectures and, and ISA extensions. You know, we're, we're pretty um, aggressively enhancing uh, the Intel instruction set, right, in a fairly short period of time. Um, and if you, you look at the sort of the history of of um, instruction set changes, especially in sort of the SIMD instructions. Um, it's been fairly slow, but it's really accelerated recently, um, starting you know, last year with SSC 4.1, which is a pretty big bump, uh, to um, AVX next year in Larrabee and I. Um, it's a pretty unprecedented rate of change for us. And so there's, you know, there's this, um, and then if you look just down at the microarchitectural level, things you have to do for an in-order architecture versus an out-of-order architecture, in-order like Atom versus, or, or Larrabee versus out-of-order like the, the CPUs, um, you know, there's other kinds of optimizations you have to do. So we use this um, sort of virtual ISA um, to, to target um, in the same backend, you know, Larrabee cores, you know, various uh, Intel or Intel compatible CPU cores, and, you know, possibly in the future, you know, non-Intel cores. You know, in some ways, it looks a little bit like LLVM, but a high-performance version. Question? Yeah. 
So I see two levels of object compiler. There. Yeah. So that you know says overhead, right? So yep. when you pay that overhead, what yep. size you know things do you need to advertise that overhead over to make it worthwhile? Well, I, I mean, I'll be a little bit about that, or I don't whether you. Yeah, to yeah. Work. No, I mean I'll be honest. Right now, we're kind of dumb about this in the sense that rather than sort of um, you know try to be clever about how much we should optimize. We've opted to optimize for compile time versus absolute performance. And so, you know, for something like those kernels you saw, it might take, um, you know, uh, maybe at most 20 milliseconds to compile um, and generate code for them. But you only compile them once, the first time you see them, right? So the first time you see that path, or if you sort of use this, this, this explicit sort of, you know, capture and compile interface, you can control exactly when that happens and how often that happens. Um, so, but in this case of those functions, if you use those, you know, you know map interfaces, we'll, we'll say, have we seen this function before? Oh, we haven't, let's compile it and cache it. If we haven't cached it, I mean, if, you know, if, if, we, if we have cached it and it's there, we won't compile it again. So the reality is though that, um, and we'll, we'll probably change, we'll probably extend this, right, it, is that we have two kinds of developers, people who care about, you know, compile times over a second and people who could care less as long as it's under a couple of minutes, right? Because they're gonna run this thing for hours. Um, and what we wanna do is give people, so you can kind of, there are some controls, some environment variables you can set that turn on and off certain optimizations, but we wanna pe let people do that at a finer grain, right? So on a per function call, you can say, you know, or per, you know, CT invocation, you can say here, you know, compile as fast as you can, right? And then, you know, or here in this other place, you know, I don't care how long it takes, just, you know, you know, pull out all the stops. So right now we're just, we're dumb about it. We just, because we expect that people will care about compile time, we try to keep things in the millisecond scale uh, for compilation. And so you, you wanted to know, I'll, in the next slide I'll show, you how, I'll show you sort of at a very high level how it works, but um, just to highlight other things here, this, this, this stage here we're doing kind of, you know, um, classical high-level optimizations, um, you know, uh, vectorization transformations, uh, and, um, you know, memory optimizations and blocking optimizations, things like that, um, where, you know, they're nominally architecture independent, although, you know, you, you tend to use architectural parameters as sort of the form of the optimizations isn't dependent on the architecture. Whereas here, you know, we're doing, you know, hardcore backend optimizations, instruction scheduling, prefetch insertion, register allocation, et cetera. Um, so we, you know, try, we try as much as possible, although as, as many of you may know, it's, it's always impossible to say that you can separate high level optimizations that are completely architecture independent from, um, and make them completely architecture independent because the decisions you make early, for example, fusing together a bunch of primitives, um, you know, to the coarsest grain task that you can. Well, guess what? If you're running on a instruction cache limited architecture, um, that's going to hurt performance. So you have to have some feedback, but it was as much as possible, we try to separate that. And so that's why I have this sort of in a dotted line, because it's, it's, um, it's not quite a hard partition there. Okay, uh, so today we support um, running on CPUs and on, on Laravee in, in pure offload mode, and uh, you know, it's, we'll probably have um, you know, hybrid mode where you can run on on both at the same time. Uh, I mean, you, sh you are running on both at the same time, but right now we just, it's uh, for the beta, it's you're just either offloading everything or you're running on the CPU. Um, and we are looking at other backends. So in particular, um, uh, we want to support more than Intel and Intel compatible processors. Um, and that includes, you know, other accelerators, GPUs and so on. So um, we're looking at options for supporting, uh, supporting those. So yes. if you would support a GPU, would you generate PTX directly or CUDA or, you know, what's we probably we probably go to something that's more portable like um, OpenCL, yeah, or GLSL for that matter. It depends on the maturity of the OpenCL implementations. OpenCL is attractive though because it does give us that portability. On the other hand, some people may, might object to, to us generating OpenCL source as a backend, whereas if we went to GLSL, we could generate ARB assembly code, which is at least somewhat obfuscated, you know. So there's some software developer considerations we have to take into account there, but OpenCL would be a nice path for that. And you know, kind of what it was designed for, right? The sort of portable hardware abstraction layer. So it makes sense. Yes, question. So what's the 
get? Like they just go to GCC, turn on their CT flag. Do they get anything for if they're the code on the left? If they're the code on the left, no. No, you have to do some transformation. We, we actually are looking at adding a preprocessor that you can sort of just add a little tag to a function and we'll figure out if it's, you know, pure enough and, and then just sort of spit out the code on the right. Uh, but uh, no, you have to make some changes. But again, you know, the, the idea is you make the changes at the leaves of your, of, your, of, your, of your object hierarchies rather than, you know, sort of, you know, these invasive top to bottom changes. So. Um, here's a little animation of how it works, if you haven't guessed already. I mean, basically, here's a, a little simple function here, and then we're going to do a, a CT call into it. And um, what happens is, you know, the first time we see this function, um, we'll uh, uh, recognize that it, uh, it hasn't been compiled, and we'll just start, um, you know, building up the IR for this thing. And, you know, I'm showing it as a sort of a single function, but this, these might actually be... The path here might be through many, many different functions, right? You know, we don't see we don't see the boundaries of these virtual function calls when we're doing this sort of generative, you know, construction of this um, of this of this graph. Uh, so, uh, but in this simple case, right, we're, we'll we'll build up this IR, and then uh, when we drop out of this function, we'll we'll see that we don't um, we'll see that we need to compile it. Compile it. Uh, we go through several lab levels of optimization. I mentioned earlier this sort of uh, abstraction layer here, based on this. Um, you know, converge vector intrinsics layer. Um, we have sort of a, all the classic high level optimizations I talked about were up here. We have this sort of interesting layer that um, I'd be happy to talk to you about offline that, that does a sort of, um, it's not like any compiler I've ever seen really. It does a sort of algorithmic mapping of high level, you know, parallel constructs onto this virtual, this abstract machine. And it's, and it's the layer where you actually say, well, I want to support a new data type. And you just sort of define some, define a few implementers that that tell you how to decompose this in terms of uh, vector and, and task parallelism and what the data layout is, and then it's automatically sort of supported in the compiler. So at some point I'll come back and talk about that, <laughs> but it, it's it's a it's a pretty cool part of the compiler. And then we have this uh, threading runtime um, that uh, looks like uh, the interface looks kind of like a almost like a very fine-grained data flow um, uh, threading runtime, but underneath it we use um, we had our own sort of homebrew runtime we were using for a while. For the product, we're using TBB because that actually gets us, you know, really good performance, and we can use TBB on CPU and on um, uh, Laravel, and uh, we can interoperate with TBB. So you can use CT within TBB tasks. Uh, so you know we can deal with data parallelism, uh, but if you're if you're uh, if you have some pipeline pattern uh, or some you know heterogeneous task parallel thing you want to do, you can just use TBB tasks around that and then within that use CT. And the nice thing about the TBB scheduler is it deals with this sort of, you know, nested generation of tasks uh, reasonably well. Okay, so let's talk about that virtual machine interface. So there's several forms of it. There's the runtime C interface that we use for the current, you know, for the CC headers and any other kind of library you build on top of that. There's actually a human-readable C++-like form, and actually, we hope that it'll um, will eventually have a C++ form that you can just sort of compile and use for testing. We ha sort of have that already for compiler debugging, but um, uh, it looks something like this, and you can, um, you know, add compiler metadata to it. Um, there's also a bytecode interface. In fact, when you use the runtime C interface, you're actually, you know, there's a um, a, a format that we use for um, operators, arguments, type, signatures, et cetera, that you just stream in. Uh, and so there's a um, uh, pretty straightforward bytecode uh, interface there for you know more compact storage or more obfuscated storage if you care <coughs> about that. Um, and the interesting thing is, is it's not really specific to the C++ CT API. I'll, I'll add a caveat to that, which is that someone asked about exceptions earlier, you know, and um, with the exception model, um, we don't yet have sort of the generic um, uh, interface for dealing with um, different kinds of, uh, of, of uh, or different languages, exception models. Um, not that there's a lot of variation, but, you know, so that you can sort of drop this over under anything that wants to throw exceptions, but um, that's pretty straightforward. Uh, so when you look at this interface, there's nothing there that says that this is a, you know, uh, a, a template Vec2D class, right? It's just a generic, you know, 2D object with this base type, and you know the base type could be a primitive type or it could be a constructed tuple type. Um, I mentioned this lower-level interface. Um, 
And you know, so one of the things I want to say here is that, so this exists, so it exists, what does it mean to developers? Well, we're kind of looking at this as a way of not just getting people to use the C++ API, but also using perhaps using the infrastructure for other stuff, right? Other languages they may care about. They may not like C++, you know, uh, C++ idioms that we're using, or they may want more domain-specific idioms in their, um, in their interfaces. Uh, so we're, we're actually working with folks to, um, you know, on the VM interface and making sure it sort of meets the requirements of a reasonable swath of, uh, of um, you know, libraries or domain-specific languages. And the idea is that ultimately we really do want to close that productivity gap. Um, it's, a, it's a big challenge for, for everyone and um, especially important to Intel because, uh, you know, we want all software, you know, that can be parallelized, parallelized and that isn't the case today, you know, for if you look at what's running on, on most systems. As I mentioned earlier, we've um, worked on a Python bytecode translator and HL cell compiler. Um, <laughs> I also mentioned earlier that um, in a lot of uh, um, uh, lot of lot of financial analytics um, kinds of um, development uh, houses or, or sites, people um, you know the the user interface, the GUI is Excel, <laughs> and Visual Basic is sort of the the glue between the different uh, models you need to sort of stick together. And the interesting thing about that, I mean, there's some technical issues around the way Visual Basic works and how it sort of starts up the runtime and, and tears it down uh, between invocations, is that, um, you know, what I talked about earlier in terms of, um, you know, sort of the modularity tax applies here too, right? So, except now you're not leaving breadcrumbs through, you know, in a class hierarchy, you're now leaving breadcrumbs between these, you know, pieces of Visual Basic glue that are being used to glue together little bits of functionality. And um, so we actually have, you know, you know stuff working now in, in Visual Basic that, um, that demonstrates how, how this works and, and how well you can do, um, you know, through that kind of, um, that kind of multi-language development interface. <coughs> With respect to the Py Python bytecode translator, yeah. do I leave little things in my my Python yes. sources it all back in? Oh, yeah, well, that's, that's the first pass, but we, but um, we're actually considering where to go with that. Uh, you know, actually, f for us, uh, that's more of a research project, and we're kind of interested in talking to people that want to sort of take it in different directions. Because with Python, you could go a lot of different ways, right? And um, uh, so, if you're interested in that, we should talk. We can give you a rundown of what we did there. Pretty simple, actually. Okay, so I'm um, three minutes over, so I'll just I'll conclude here. Um, so this kind of generative, this generative style of dynamic code generation, I think, is, um, is really important for getting rid of the sort of modularity and, you know, more broadly productivity tax associated with, um, with, um, with modern programming techniques. So, you know, getting, you know, late binding and, um, you, know, um, you know, flexible uh, parameter, you know, poly polymorphism and flexible parameter um, uh, uh, usage is, is really nice, but it has a performance impact. And, um, you know, this kind of um, dynamic code generation, can, you know, uh, can really help. I mean, you know, the idea that dynamic code generation in the style of, uh, of you know, a JVM or, or .NET, um, you know, means uh, low performance um, is, is a really narrow view, or it's based on, you know, um, you know, that particular style of uh, dynamic compilation, but the sort of more generative programming approach can um, actually yield significantly higher per performance than the C or C++ versions. Um, and, you know, their, their existence proofs here. Um, you know, so we can use this for, uh, you know, both, you know, sort of the library cases we looked at, but also the languages, you know, and in a sense, you know, we're, we're taking advantage of the same things in that, that, that are that provide that kind of modularity and, and flexibility in libraries are the features that we look <coughs> for in a lot of these, you know, high-level, you know, kind of productivity languages. And, um, you know, we've seen that the same thing can, can help there as well. Um, the other side of it, of course, and, and this is one of the original motivations for looking at this, is that it um, allows us to adapt to a pretty rapidly changing hardware landscape, both in terms of Intel architecture, but just more broadly, right, in terms of what architecture looks like, you know, the, the broader sense of what you're running on isn't just, uh, 
a CPU, but a CPU plus integrated graphics cores, plus Larabee cores, plus some GPU cores, uh, and whatnot. And so there's a lot of different combinations of that, and you, you want to be able to sort of um, adapt to, you know, those different kinds of uh, architectures, um, um, you know, nimbly. Uh, and, you know, one of the things that, um, that we're really interested in, I think has gotten some attention recently, work that was done here and at Berkeley and elsewhere, is looking at auto-tuning and um, sort of the combination of this kind of dynamic code generation uh, and auto-tuning is, is really, really powerful, especially when we start looking at, as we are now, uh, locality optimizations. Um, uh, you can do, uh, um, you, can, you can often do better than what expert programmers would do, you know, in the first pass or two of, of trying to optimize code manually. Um, so that's it. Any questions? Yes. So I, I just wanted to clarify what I understood. Okay. At, at least in one of the slides, you talked about your um, average C++ developer taking those data structures, translating them into C++ data structures using API and yeah. the hardware abstraction layer, yeah. where you have thread, threading, and memory management, where race conditions and memory block problems can occur. Yeah. You are sort of leaving that to the hardware? No, well, we're leaving it to us as the runtime implementers. So if you use the, um, if you use the uh, CT data types and operators, um, then, you know, by default, you know, there's no possibility of data rating. Um, now, if you do things like, you know, taking off some of the safeties around, you know, doing computation in place and so on, um, then you open yourself up to that, but you're doing that if you're an expert. The only, in, the, in the former case, if the only way a data race um, could occur is if we made a mistake in implementing this. Uh, so, um, and it's interesting, you know, one of the, early on, uh, someone asked me if, uh, you know, well, how would this work with transactional memory? And I, and I thought that this was actually the ideal use case for something like transactional memory, which is implementing this kind of runtime. Because, you know, I don't care so much about performance. I really care that it just works and it always works, right? You know, the performance will come from what I do to code, right? Not so much from, you know, the, uh, what happens in the runtime, right? Uh, so, yeah, I mean, you're, you're, like any one of these runtimes, you're only as good as the, reliable as the runtime implementation is. Does that answer your question? Okay. Uh, are you providing some simulation tools? Um, For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.